dog to be out. Mubar shouted against the wind, then added a hark in an overacted kind of way. What is this lot I hear? He hammed as he and Custard ceased their promenade in the shadow of the shed. Is that not maestro Phil Omonia's duck pond musical masterpiece I hear? I asked Custard blankly. Pushing open the shed door, they found Mouse up to his ears, arranging the music for the big event. Every note of Maestro Philomonia's duck pond masterpiece will be synchronized with the dancers on the ice. Every step they take, every slide, every tour d'ankle, every pose will be matched by a musical note, squeaked Mouse. Grandioso, grandioso, applauded Rhubarb and swept off, leaving Mouse to his music and a bewildered custard in a bad tempo. Next morning, Rhubarb opened the sky ports in his shed roof, heave hoed the horses, and raised the weather forecast gear into the sky, all by the touch of a button, a shirt button. It was heady stuff as a dog bowl of water went skywards, and within minutes, the reading on its H2O content was freezing. That's it, Rhubarb thought to himself. That's it, everybody! Rhubarb announced to the world. Tonight is the night. The Rhubarb's Garden Ballet Company presents Duck Pond on Ice. 7.30 on the dot, on the pond. All welcome. <laughs> As the afternoon wore on, Post Dog's dog's bodies set out rows of chairs around the pond, while Rookie's bobber buzzards prowled the area and set up security for the event. Moggy Malone practiced her musical scales while she gargled, Poodle Princess rehearsed her voice, red lorry, yellow lorry, and Rookie tested the sound system. A one, a two, a one, a two, a. The lights were lit and the pond froze. Everything was perfect. Hustling and bustling was rife as the eager lovers of the ballet filled the available seating. Latecomers stood without qualms, ready to leave early because of the cold, but overall hoping for a great night out. Traditionally, the kickoff to Duck Pond is loud and dramatic. And so, as Poodle Princess announced the spectacular open, her voice was swamped again, this time by the symbolic opening of the music and the thunderous crash as Dame Monge Blamange, Custard, leapt cat-like, or in true ballet parlance, par du chat, onto the ice with a heavy thump. Rover the duck jetted onto the pond like a rocket and sent poor Dame Monge Blamange, Custard, pirouetting round the set in a tizzle. <sighs> And while the birds were beating about in the background, Rookie, the witty uncle, swung overhead and delivered his lines as best he could. Oi! Pas de deux, my French, but go blimey! How many times do I have to tell you, beautiful princess, you ain't to be seen about with that foul creature? The duck. Standing on a box and bellowing through a megaphone, Poodle Princess battled on with the telling of the tale. And so... Well, it's silly that the wicked uncle has found her before she can marry Rover, the rowdy prince duck. Dame Mange Blamange, Custard, the beautiful princess, weeps uncontrollably. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful princess weeps uncontrollably, darling. All right? <laughs> With Prince Duck skating on a breakneck spirit, and Dame Mange Blamange, Custard, the beautiful princess, overacting the uncontrollable weeping, the birds began to pirouette their way well, barge actually, to the front of the ship and began swanning about the park as though they owned the place. What followed would probably not be classed as pure ballet. However, it was pure entertainment. The audience seemed to love the spectacle as the birds demonstrated three-tier balancing acts, plate whirling, and a breathtaking group somersault as their finale. All on ice. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dame Monge Blamange, Custard, the beautiful princess, carried on wailing, and Rookie, the wicked uncle, begged to be helped down from the high wire, while Rover the duck continued speed skating and made everyone feel whirly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the evening never ended? Squeaked Mouse. Well, I think it'll end one way or another pretty soon because, just for the record, I think that pond has a crack in it, chuckled Rupert. And so as Mouse thumped the sound equipment, Moggy Malone drew breath, and as the prince and princess flew off in their golden coach and lived happily ever after, 
poodle princess finally got a word in. I don't know about Golden Coach. More like Duck a la carte, quipped Rhubarb. The morning it happened, Rhubarb knew that the day ahead would turn out to be a nightmare. It had been a wobbly night. There had been a lot of dreams, a lot of twitching, and a lot of noise. Now, this. It was early. Rhubarb's alarm clock hadn't even considered barking. He was ticking quietly in his sleep. A stone rattled against the window, and in a single leap, Rhubarb was wide awake, out of bed, and across the room when his bone phone started up. Yes, what is it? He snapped as the doorbell rang. Moggy Malone was yoo-hooing, Poodle Princess was being overdramatic, and the birds were carrying on in the old conquer tree. Best open your curtains, squeaked Mouse, and Rhubarb did. Then he closed them. Then he opened them. The garden was fence-to-fence, -fence, capacity football crowd, gnomes. Fishing gnomes, skiing gnomes, plant pot-holding gnomes, old cobbler gnomes, reindeer gnomes, fat gnomes and thin gnomes, and one on the fence gnome. Uh, no, that was custard. Thank you, Mouse, said Rhubarb with a heavy heart. Oh, garden gnomes, he sighed. The gnomes have finally invaded, he whispered. Stepping out into the crowded garden, Rhubarb was surrounded. What's your game then, gnome? Rhubarb asked, and the gnome said he was the on-off gnome. I knew that, said Rhubarb suavely, as he switched the switch to on. Instantly, the garden was bustling with every known gnome activity. The fishing gnomes fished, the hammering gnomes hammered, the jolly gnomes told jokes, it was a riot. Stop! shouted Rhubarb, and turned them all off in an instant. Haven't you got anything better to do than indulge in these absurd activities? He barked. I think not, Rhubarb sighed, and with a quick flick of the on-off switch, the gnomes switched fleetingly before paying full attention to Rhubarb once again. Now, Rhubarb spattered, this is what we are going to do. We are going to do something constructive. <laughs> something funny, wheelbarrow gnome. We are going to do something useful. As you are all garden gnomes, we are going to hold a garden party. OK? Yes, Rhubarb. All agreed, then. There'll be a garden party on the lawn at four o'clock. All welcome. Thank you, announced Rhubarb and marched off to his shed. It was noisy, to say the least, as Rhubarb, complete with straw motor, arrived to find a welcome from Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess, who were warming up the good crowd. Thank you, beamed Rhubarb. The first game of the afternoon will be Name That Gnome, he announced. And as a band struck up, the sparkling Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess ushered the bashful custom to centre stage. As our first Name That Gnome contestant, Please welcome Mr. Custard! Thank you. Now just turn around and name that gnome. Rhubarb smarmed as Custard turned. Ah, 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 ah. Gardman! spluttered Custard. Thank you. Better luck next time. Rhubarb leered, and the unfortunate cat was led away. Without missing a beat, Rhubarb welcomed the next contestant. And you, sir, are... Postdog. It's me, P Postdog, said Postdog. OK, Postdog, name that gnome, grinned Rhubarb, and spun poor Postdog around to face the screen. Oh, uh, fishing, said Postdog warily. Yes! 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 said Rhubarb and pounded the air while Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess presented Postdog with a large, pink, fluffy nose. The next event will be Sue Darcy! <laughs> what on earth is that noise? Rhubarb demanded as everyone cringed. Going gnome time, explained the mushroom gnome. 
They beam it down from our planet Gnome, up in the space. We must go now. It's been nice visiting, but there's no place like Gnome. Oh, well, Gnome sweet, Rhubarb began saying, when everyone noticed the Gnome alone. Shouldn't you have gone, Gnome? <laughs> Custard was tittering over his own joke when the Gnome spoke. <laughs> I can't. It sobbed. I'm, I'm concrete. It sighed, and all the garden animals gasped and took pity on the tearful nugget. You can stay here, said Rupert, and everyone cheered, except Custard, who was jealous. As the first of the evening stars began to twinkle in the twilight sky, Custard sulked on his fence, and Rhubarb was just about to draw his curtains when he noticed something rather rum going on down by the old conquer tree. Hold it right there, Rhubarb barked, as one of the post dog's weasels was about to exchange a fistful of notes to another with a sack slung over his shoulder. Startled, the pair took off into the night and left Rhubarb and the sack standing stock still in the starlight. You could have ended up in a theme park, huffed Rhubarb as he patted the gnome on the head. You all right? he asked, only to be answered by a tear and stony silence. Never mind. I'll have you cemented to my patio tomorrow. You can be my gnome from gnome, he chuckled privately. I heard that. Don't you ever give up on the corny jokes. Uh... On the sideboard where Rhubarb kept his bone china, there was a photograph of himself taken in the garden on the occasion of his first flight. Ah, the spike. Those were the days he thought, just as his bone fell around. It was Mouse, Roven Scholar, to say that he saw no reason why Stratopod Rocket couldn't be designed on Roostar, the very latest of Rhubarb software, designed especially for stargazing and deep probing into the space. Thank you, Mouse. Good night, said Rhubarb in a chillingly Gaelic kind of way. Um, not a uh, interrupt in our heart. No, Custard, come in, old chap. Sit down. Have a fish, said Rupert. Dreaming about the old days, eh? Inquired Custard. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the new designs for the Stratopod and high-speed rocket travel through the space, Rhubarb murmured. After a restless night thinking about lightning speed travel and how, thanks to him, millions would someday be able to journey through the space, one end of the earth to the other, in eight minutes, in luxury, in a stratopod. Rhubarb stumbled into the garden. Great flying weather, grinned Custard. Ah, Custard, of course, beamed Rhubarb, the perfect research guinea pig. Here, yeah. what's brightened you up? inquired Custard. You have my dear friend, smiled Rhubarb. How would you like to be? A stratopod pilot. A test stratopod pilot, no less. Hmm. We're going to need a pilot, Mouse puffed as he spread the very latest stratopod plans out on the lawn. Got one, chirped Rhubarb, and they went over the plans. And by late afternoon, a wind tunnel design had been perfected. Some of the birds chirped in and helped build the wind tunnel, which would test the aerodynamic properties of custom, soon to become the world's first stratopod test pilot. Now then, Custard, this could be dangerous, so pay attention, said Rhubarb, just as Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess strolled by. Ah, oh, going somewhere nice, inquired Rhubarb. To the fur dressers, darling, said Poodle Princess. Got tickets for the Big Rock concert? Grinned Moggy Malone. Oh, and we're working on a big rocket concept, beamed Rhubarb, and the birds went wild. See you later, smiled Rhubarb, and Mouse began briefing Custard. The, uh, the configuration and structure of our body, bo bo bodies is such that when propelled beyond certain speeds, an effect known as G-force becomes... Yes, yes, let's get on with it, Mouse, for goodness sake, said Rhubarb, who took charge and got straight to the point. This structure is designed with great expectations and it is called a wind tunnel. Uh. Its purpose, as you will soon find out, 
is to test the shape of my test pilot, that's you, before you take off like grease lightning in my new stratopod into the space. <laughs> this pole is known as the hold pole. Pay attention and you will grasp it thus, Rhubarb demonstrated and felt a certain degree of achievement as Custard's paws curled around the support. Questions? Rhubarb asked and Custard said he wondered what was the tea. <laughs> This is hardly the time to be thinking about afternoon tea, barked Rhubarb, then turned and nodded to Mouse. Prepare to switch on, Rhubarb called, and Mouse, rodent scholar, tugged with all his might at the mighty red lever. Ah! As the blades of the great fan gathered momentum, the airy breeze inside the wind tunnel turned to a flurry. Custard tightened his grip on the whole pole and the hurricane followed. The brilliant future of Stratopod right here in front of us, roared Mouse proudly. History in the making, Rhubarb bellowed in a scientific kind of way, just as Rookie strolled up to see what all the noise was about and was stripped naked, leaving Custard coughing and sputtering while Mouse struggled to turn the fan off. When Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess returned from the fur dressers, they found Mouse, Roden Scholar, in shock. Rookie was standing starkers inside a cardboard box. Rhubarb had a blank look on his face, and Custard stood stunned, still holding the whole pole, which he'd torn, boats and all, from its concrete foundations. Moggy Malone stood and stared. Her mouth was locked open. There was a teeny weeny squeak as she stared at the wobbly pink blob, only just recognizable as Custard. He'll be fine, whispered Rhubarb. <laughs> Too long in the wind tunnel, explained Mouse. Ha <laughs> ha. Cup of tea? Rhubarb went on in a skillful and diplomatic kind of way. Where's Poodle Princess? he added. She's here noted Moggy Malone as she pointed to the tangle that was only just recognisable as Poodle Princess. Fur dryer, far too long, Moggy whispered as Rhubarb stood with his mouth open, not a peep. Oh, darlings, I can't go to the Big Rock concert looking like this, screamed Poodle Princess. And I'm not going on no rocket trip looking like this, wailed Custard. <laughs> And Rookie saw the funny side of things and switched on the wind tunnel again. And everyone laughed till they couldn't stand up. Rhubarb and Custard sat in their favourite old comfy chairs, stargazing. It was a brilliant night and they had million dollar seats to the best show on earth, the space. Millions of years, said Rhubarb quietly. Millions said Custard. Billions of stars twinkling in the space. Been there for all of time, mused Rhubarb. Yeah, twinkling, yawned Custard. Ever thought of becoming a time traveller? Rhubarb said with a sudden thought. Nah, no time really, said Custard and slurped on his straw. You know, smiled Rhubarb, as the idea of Custard zooming back and forth between millions of time zones built in his mind. You could, he smiled in a wicked Custard kind of way, travel back and forth. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, between here, there and everywhere. Imagine, you could visit ancient events. Could be at the first Olympic sports do on the moon. You could win gold in fencing. <laughs> now, don't look at me like that. This is serious, said Rhubarb. Right. I try to do my best, but you're not interested, are you? Rhubarb pouted. No, not really, said Custard. I had enough of yesterday, and I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. But today has been boring. No sense of adventure, said Rhubarb, and picked up his bone phone. Mouse, Mouse, are you busy? Rhubarb whispered. Y 
Yes, Mouse, I know it's your cheese and lion dancing night, and I know that it's popular in Silicon Valley, but I have something much more exciting, so could you scoot over and start my computer? Scoot and boot, so to say, said Rhubarb. Mouse finally arrived, wearing a large plastic Wild West hat and tall lizard boots. Howdy, said Rhubarb. Then, not wanting to waste a moment, he went straight into explaining the time spanner. A unit of cranium apparel that allows the wearer to span time itself. In other words, a sophisticated mechanical hat that takes the wearer back through time. To where, may I ask? Shrugged Mouse. To history. To history. Uh, where in history would you like to go wearing this uh, time spanner? Asked the boot-tapping Mouse. You don't go in a time spanner, explained Rubab. The expression is beamed. Custard here wishes to be beamed to somewhere other than here. I'm staying put to control the mission, said Rhubarb, and before Custard could get a word in, he was ready for off. I'll be me along where the dinosaurs roar. Custard bleated. It's a bit ambitious, zooming back millions of years to the dinosaur age, sweet mouse. How about visiting last week, for starters? The dinosaur age it is, said Rhubarb. Come on, Mouse. Get that thar mouse wheel a spinner. Let the good times roll, whooped Rhubarb. Y'all come back, you hear? Yeehaw! Said Mouse in a silly, silicone valley kind of way. Step inside Rhubarb's time machine, and instantly the visitor becomes transported to one of the many magnificent moments in history, or even beyond. Here we see the playful custard frolicking with dinosaurs. Yes, we are. Any number of different vibes can be experienced with the amazing time spanner. What about 1066? Everyone knows that, indeed. Exactly, said Rhubarb, and dialed in the Battle of Hastings. Nah, I'm not interested, shouted Custard. <laughs> Here's a nice juicy date. 1663, the Black Death. Ugh, sounds horrid, shuddered Rhubarb. And as he keyed in 1663, this black sewer started to give custom some offer. Ah, oh, had enough of this, said Custard, and yanked the time spanner lever and beamed himself back into the shed. What on earth is the matter, Custard, old thing? Time travel, not your thing? Did you see them rats? Oh, come on, what's a few rats? What about the real old days? What about the Ice Age? The Age of Chivalry? No? What about the future, then? You can go anywhere in that hat. Let's dial the future, shouted Rhubarb. Yeah! Where's Mouse? asked Custard quietly and looked around. Never mind Mouse, said Rhubarb. Let's see what the future has in store. I don't need the time spanner, said Custard. I can see quite clearly what is about to happen. Any minute, he added, and with that the door burst open and the complete thousand boots of Silicon Valley cheese and lion dancers club thundered through Rhubarb's shed and left a mark on history that Rhubarb won't forget in a hurry. Ever see you and me cheese and lion dancing in the future? Rhubarb asked. Nah said Custard, and slurped on his straw. Millions of years, said Rhubarb quietly. Millions, said Custard. Billions of stars twinkling in the space. Twinkling, said Custard. You ever thought of being a time traveller? asked Custard. <sighs> no, said Rhubarb. And a dinosaur looked in through the sky. It was quite early. No, it was probably earlier, because in fact, no one had heard a peep from the early birds as yet. And that is when Rhubarb discovered Moggy Malone under the old conker tree, singing as chirpy as a song. With one more step, Rhubarb found himself standing in sunbeams, listening to Poodle Princess, expressing how wonderful life is by reciting one of her lovely poems. One day in May, I had to say, hooray. Yes, I did. 
Say hooray. One day in May. How truly delightful, sighed Rhubarb, and melodramatic kisses were shared all round. I'm afraid that I don't have anything so beautiful, sobbed Moggy Malone. Call that poem rubbish, more like, wailed Custard. Oh, do be quiet. You sound like an old bagpipe, sighed Rhubarb in a theatrical kind of way, and then swept around to address Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess. What say thee, ye maidens of music and theatre, to a day of ye old-fashioned entertainment, a medieval country fair, complete with coconut shies, juggling, candy floss, a hall of mirrors, ballads, a jumping castle, and you two delightful creatures, sugared rhubarb. But I don't have anything as beautiful as <laughs> you shall sing my poem. Smiled Poodle Princess. I will, trilled Moggy Malone. I will. Oh, how wonderful it's going to be, darling, cried Poodle Princess. Yes, yes. Oh, no. Be off with you, snapped Rhubarb, then changed his mind. Nay, come ye back, he called. We'll need all the peasants we can get, he whispered. And it was then that Custard was convinced that it was going to be another long day. Mouse rodent scholar from Silicon Valley turned up with a chirpy hi and was met with a combined wassails, the friendliest of medieval greetings. <laughs> In the shed, Mouse was on the mouse wheel, jogging the computer into life, while Rhubarb's paws flew over the keyboard. Rhubarb picked up his bone phone and called post dog to discuss a few things while Mouse sat in the old armchair and tried to catch up with his breath. Post dog, have you still got my lap dog computer? Well, it's a good job you haven't sold it. Now listen carefully. I want a complete medieval country fair built, complete with coconut shies, juggling, candy floss, a hall of mirrors and a jumping castle for this afternoon. Well, if you can't do it, I'll have to go direct to the weasels. Four o'clock. OK, I'll beam the designs over to your... to my lapdog, said Rhubarb. And with that, Mouse was out of the chair, opening the ceiling ports, ready to beam the order across to Postdog. As the satellite dish whirred its way out of the shed roof, Rhubarb announced that there would be... Ye medieval country fair! Four o'clock on the lawn! <laughs> he then turned to Moggy Malone and Poodle Princess to discuss the music and theatre events. Well, Postdog, I must say this is one of your better efforts, chortled Rhubarb, as he surveyed the trappings of his very own medieval country fair, the likes of which had ne'er been seen for many a year. So, uh, here we are at the jumping castle. Oh, and this is its control disc, said Postdog. Just whack it into your computer and it'll keep the pressure perfectly correct, no matter how many jumpers. Right, said Rhubarb, and gave the disc to Mouse, rodent scholar from Silicon Valley. I don't suppose you've ever been to a medieval country fair before, eh? No, anything like them, he said, and announced, Ye medieval country fair, open! <laughs> Immediately, Poodle Princess began to recite, One day in May, I had to, I say, had to say hooray. hooray. While at the same time, Moggy Malone began to belt out her musical version of the medieval ditty. One day in me, I had to say hooray. Oh, yes, I did say hooray. One day in me. What on earth is going on over there? Custard bawled, and Rhubarb waved a very large fish-flavoured candy floss under his nose and invited him over. Oh, it's all quite exciting, isn't it? slurped Custard, and Rhubarb coaxed him to have a try at the stalls. <laughs> when Rhubarb and Custard wobbled out from the Hall of Mirrors, they were laughing so much they could hardly stand up. Hey there! <laughs> if we can't stand up, we might as well have a go on a jumping castle, said Custard. Lead the way, said Rhubarb. 
As rhubarb and custard somersaulted and autumn sorted and were having the time of their lives, custard pointed out that the jumping castle had grown so big it had squeezed the rest of ye medieval country fair into the four corners of rhubarb's garden. Oh, shouted rhubarb. Mouse, mouse, did you remember to put the pressure control disc into the computer? He barked every time he got close to Mouse. Mouse shook his head and Custard <laughs> roared with laughter as the jumping castle got bigger and bigger. And English dog kennel is his dog house, Rhubarb shouted. Yeah, ha, ha, and you're in it. <laughs> he laughed, Custard. It was a very still day. Not a leaf moved. The clouds didn't move. The statue-like birds didn't move. The bird that liked statues didn't move. It was a very still day indeed. Then, before Rhubarb could pick up whatever it was that had kept him so still for so long, a muddy hand grabbed at the artifact. <laughs> Now things were moving along. Oh my, he is angry about something, thought Custard. As Rhubarb bellowed at the grass. Oh, ah, oh, uh, Custard, didn't see you, swallowed Rhubarb, and Custard said nothing. Uh, nice day. Uh, thought I saw something shiny. Hand, gone, Rhubarb babbled. In the safety of the shed, Rhubarb was feeling really silly about yelling at the grass when suddenly Mole's trap door opened. Was that you making me look stupid in front of Custard? Rhubarb demanded. What are you talking about, boy? asked Mole. I am talking about you grabbing my ancient Roman coin just when I was about to pick it up. That is what I am talking about, Mole, huffed Rhubarb. Didn't know you were there, spluttered Mole through a mouthful of coal. You shall have it back. Come on. How long has all this been here, right under my shed? Rhubarb echoed in a surprised kind of way. Oh, years, said Mole, and on down the damp stone stairway they went to the treasure trove room. Gold coins, diamonds, Roman swords, ancient Greek stuff, and even pictures of Egyptian buskins stacked to the ceiling. Mo, where did you get all this? Rhubarb whispered. Daft Romans, said Mo. They lost togas, swords, umbrellas, spears, shields, bus tickets, all kinds of stuff. They even lost an empire, boy. Yes, but where's the treasure I found? whispered Rhubarb. Somewhere. There's heaps of stuff all over, or rather, under your garden. Mo muttered and mumbled and rummaged. Oh, really? gawped Rhubarb. And what are those? Mole hills, said Mo. They leave them all over lawns. Silly, really, but there we are. There's heaps of stuff all over, if you know where to look, of course. I could start a museum, Rhubarb daydreamed. I'd even allow cats in, he murmured. Of course, treasure finding togs, chuckled Rhubarb in an Egyptology kind of way. Grinding, filing, hammering, and welding noises came from the shed while Custard sat on the fence, very still. It was around four o'clock when Rhubarb appeared. I'm off to find more treasure, he announced and stumbled out onto the lawn in his new electric outfit and set off up the garden. All afternoon, up and down, up and down, up and down the lawn. He's been thundering up and down that ceiling all afternoon and found nothing. Best help him out, Mo decided, as he went into his treasure room and came back with a fistful of gold coins and glittering trinkets. Rubbish mostly, but quite nice, said Mo, and placed the ancient Egyptian swag under a molehill for rhubarb to unearth.
Ow! Oh, 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 lucky me! shuddered Rhubarb and took off his treasure finding outfit. Holding up his vine, Rhubarb blew, wiped, and stared. Ancient Egypt, he whispered to himself. What could it be? He breathed in a breathless kind of way and rubbed the booty till it shone like the day it was lost. Two pyramids? No, an Egyptian cat. Well, 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 the reclining one should enjoy this, said Rhubarb, and polished the disc some more. As Rhubarb polished and buffed, the disc shone and shimmered until he could not believe his eyes. The ground trembled. The sun went in. The sky went dark. Moe scarpered. The birds went quiet. Custard stirred. The pyramids! Of course! The curse! barked Rhubarb and demanded to know what on earth is going on. And as he spoke, the majestic image of Miao, the ancient Egyptian god cat, appeared and loomed over the garden and cast her generous shadow over a nervous custom. The spirit of Meow grants the most generous wish to the miserable one known as Custom. Speak your pitiful wish, Pink One. Oh, uh, oh, uh, well, uh, aha. Uh, -huh. uh, uh, what, uh, what to say? Uh, 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 I wish for a gold. Aha, uh -huh. aha, uh -huh. aha. Uh -huh. I wish this would stop! It was a very still day. <laughs> Rhubarb had been trilling up and down music scales all morning, while Mouse, Roman scholar, ran up and down the piano keys. La 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 What are you doing? asked Custard. Laying the foundations for a garden opera house that will become famous for its patented flying roof. Oh yeah, said Custard. Go on then. Give us a rendering, a sneak preview. <laughs> Firstly, said Rhubarb in a C-sharp major kind of way. I detect a certain cynicism. And secondly, I am not an opera singer, and neither Mouse, a concert pianist, is. Well, I could have told you that, said Custard, and left. Never mind, said Mouse. I think it's great. Jolly good. All we need now is a diva to sing my opera, said Rhubarb in an operatic kind of way, and swept off to find one. Ah, Poodle Princess, are you up to being a diva for the evening? A diva, darling, purred Poodle Princess, while Rhubarb carried on ah! in rich Covent Garden tones, and Poodle Princess strangled a musical scale of C to within an inch of F sharp. <laughs> I'll call you, cringed Rhubarb as Moggy Malone came strolling along, singing Sweet Nothings oh. and gathering snapdragons. Moggy Malone, beamed Rhubarb, how would you like to make a name for yourself on the boards? <laughs> Opera singer, he whispered. On the stage, me. But be voice, I'm out of practice for opera, she warbled. In a memento, Rhubarb was on the bone phone, explaining to Mouse he'd found a diva, well, a singer of sorts. Mouse said not to worry. He was a rock opera anyway. And, he added, if she's any good, she's sure to get her arias into gear before the curtain goes up. After an announcement from Rhubarb, a good crowd began to gather on the opera garden lawn. I hear there's to be a flying opera house roof, built to fend off any storm, musical or otherwise, said Rookie. It's unthinkable said Mrs. Hedgehog. That was the Titanic, muttered Moe. And being Welsh and knowing about melody and stuff, in a minor way, of course, he added that 
he was worried. But uh, didn't you once have an automatic music tuning machine, Mo? I did. I'll give it up, said Mo. The first stars appeared on the warm summer's night sky, and the outdoor flying opera house roof was on its way. When the opera started, Moggy Malone did her best. It was called Dogs. The crowd murmured and shuffled, some tittered. Where's Moe's music tuning machine? Mouse demanded, and Rhubarb snapped in a petrol first night kind of way that he was ready. Instantly, Moggy's voice perked up, as did the good crowd. Her rusty notes radiated into the warm night air, and just as she reached her zenith, a new note was heard rumbling above Rhubarb's opera garden. Billed as the flying opera house roof, it sidled into position and anchored over the evening's event. With the new roof and Moe's music tuning machine in place, Moggy Malone's voice began to shower the good crowd. Hurrah! Bravo! Encore! The good crowd wanted more. So far, so good with Rhubarb, as the flying opera house roof began to groan and hiss and snort. Oh, what on earth was that? He gasped. Opera singers can shatter all sorts of stuff, you know, boy. Glass, rubber, wood. I reckon she shattered the new flying opera house roof and my music tuner, said Mo. Turn that music tuning machine off, growled Rhubarb. Cut, said Mouse. Well, get her off, hissed Rhubarb in a loud stage whisper kind of way. The good crowd love her, and she loves them. And so with that, Moggy Malone belted out her song as the flying opera house roof ripped itself to shreds in a storm of rock operatic gusto, then floated gently down and covered everything. Good crowd and all. As the muffled tones of dogs continued, several cool cats arrived and sat on the fence. Then it happened. The first scrawny-looking cat started it, then another, and another, until the whole of the opera garden was infested with hundreds of scraggy cats squeezing along with the muted tones of Poodle Princess, Rock Diva. Custard, will you please ask these friends of yours to leave? demanded Rhubarb as he dragged Moggy Malone out from under the tattered flying opera house roof. Should have called me, die, crooned Poodle Princess. Oh, please, begged Rhubarb as he pleaded with the disheveled Moggy Malone to stop. On with the show, shouted Custom. It's the first time we've heard, dogs. My friends love it. They have a feeling for it. Music with feline. Get it, darling? And Rhubarb gave up and joined the crowd on the fence. And they sang to the moon and turned milk sour. Whiz, the home of ABCs, 1, 2, 3s, and all your favourite kids' TV characters. Now let's find kids' TV. Or I can press this microphone. Whiz, that's how easy it is.